All right, panel two is about to begin, so if you can please uh, start finding uh, your seats. Thank you. about 10 to 12 minutes. Willie each. Loman, right? Um, <laughs> Willie Loman. Shelly, the death of a salesman. Yeah, when, yeah. when you're finished, you know, I'll I move it into moderated discussion. And then, um, yes. Uh, Hi, everyone. If you could please find your seats, we're going to start with the well, second panel. Uh -huh. And uh, if you yeah. get through the and second panel, then there's lunch. So the faster we sit down, the faster we get to eat. Freshman English teacher assigned it. I didn't realize it. Can I look inside? I think yeah. I neglected to turn the power on. It's just, considering that it's 70 years old, mm -hmm. it's an incredible view into the outlook of black people in mm -hmm. America in a different era, before Brown and, mm -hmm. and the Board of Education. It's a good book. Mm -hmm. It's a novel. It's a yeah. novel, okay. but it's like, Oops, you know, you take this journey through the black experience. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I don't. It's a smaller one. Are we all set to go here? Well, welcome to the uh, GTI's panel number two, the TRA and Taiwan's international space. We have four of uh, probably the country's top experts on Taiwan. Uh, and it's two, at least two of the experts on its uh, international space. Um, first, we'll have uh, Ambassador Steve Young, or is it Ambassador Dr. Steve Young? First time we met was in Taipei in 1982. And uh, Steve's Chinese is OK at that point. And I wondered, why, what he, why was he at the AIT Taipei? Well, he had just finished his PhD in uh, Soviet studies, so his Russian was quite good. But Not Soviet, like Russian. Yes. There's a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> um, Steve will talk first. Uh, number two will be Shelley Rigger, who is, needs no introduction, except to say that she's probably the, I'm trying to think of anybody else, she's probably the expert on Taiwan domestic politics in the United States, who is not him or herself a Taiwanese, with the possible exception of Mike Fonte, but uh, Mike doesn't. <laughs> so, it, um, and Shelley's written several books, uh, both of which are uh, essential reading for anybody that's an expert in Taiwan. Uh, third, we'll have, uh, amb not ambassador, uh, R Dr. Richard Bush. Again, Richard Bush needs no introduction. He spent a lot of time uh, on Capitol Hill. Uh, he was national 
intelligence officer for East Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, he was then plucked from that job prematurely and forced to serve as chairman of AIT for a number of years. Um, I don't know anybody that, and, and I first knew him back in 1979 when I was on the Taiwan desk and he was on Capitol Hill. Uh, and he's been involved deeply in Taiwan affairs ever since then. Um, Thank you. Last but, is it last but not least? Yes. Um, last but not least, Walter Lohman, my former boss at the Heritage Foundation. Walter is an expert in U.S. Uh, Southeast Asian relations. Uh, he'll, I think, find himself a little bit uh, overpowered when it comes to Taiwan's international space in the U.S.-Taiwan context. And he'll look at Taiwan's new strategy of uh, the southbound policy, which is a, a pretty uh, in, uh, intensive departure from where Taiwan has been going in the last uh, 12 years. Uh, Li Denghui had a southbound policy, and the new policy, I think, is, uh, is, is going to yield uh, great uh, benefits. Um, I don't want to keep us here too long. The idea is to have uh, each of the speakers speak from 10 to 12 minutes. I will then pick up on that and have a sort of a moderated discussion for a little while, ask maybe 10 to 12 minutes of questions and answers, and then we'll throw it open to um, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, hopefully, we'll be done in about an hour and 10 minutes. Um, so can I ask Ambassador Young, Dr. Young, to Professor Young? <laughs> I would still call me late for supper. Yeah. He's, <laughs> Professor Young has, by the way, all, I, perhaps the most experience in Taiwan, except for me. Uh, <laughs> you were there in the in the 1962 to 63 to 65. 63 to 65. So that was 55 years ago. So you can imagine how old he is. <laughs> I'm I was sorry. Very young. <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. I was going to say some nice things about you, John, but now I'm not so sure. Um, I'm really pleased to be here, and uh, congratulations to Chairman Lai and to Russell Shaw for the uh, incredibly rapid growth of uh, GTI over the last year. Um, John and I do have some roots going back to Taiwan. Uh, our fathers both served in the military advisory group at different eras. but. Uh, uh, as a result, I, I have had the pleasure of watching Taiwan grow from what was a fairly modest little place in 1963 when I arrived with water buffalo and coolies in the fields to a high-tech center. Uh, it's always great to be with Richard Bush, Shelley, uh, both leading lights in Taiwan studies and people from whom I've learned a lot. Um, as far as TRA is concerned, I think what's remarkable about this 38-year-old document is less its specific language and more the spirit of creativity that practitioners of Taiwan policy have applied to it. For example, the desire of Taiwan's friends here in America and around the world to maximize this remarkable island's engagement and participation in the world continues to ensure that the 23 million people of Taiwan and their representatives around the world have a meaningful voice in matters that concern them. I had the privilege of working with some of the central architects of US policy toward Taiwan in my 33 plus years in government. Among them, David Dean, Jim Lilly, and Kurt Campbell, who never worried too much about what they could not do under the TRA so much as calculating what was possible in the practical uh, realm. This, of course, involved assuring that we treated our Taiwan counterparts with all the respect and dignity that representatives of this great island deserved. I uh, remember accompanying Stan Brooks to the airport in early 1982 when Jim Lilly flew in to assume his responsibilities as AIT director. Stan was very old school and worried that Jim would go around the Tecro reps to talk directly with the MFA folks, particularly Fred Chen, at the airport, and worse yet, maybe speak substantively with the local press. Well, Jim proceeded to jump right in, 
and later told me that it was the obligation of those involved in relations with Taiwan to treat their representatives with every bit of dignity and respect that they deserved. Um, and I think that was sound advice that I've been able to follow to the best of my ability over the years that, that I've uh, been working on Taiwan. Jim, as many of you remember, had worked for George Bush Sr. in the early liaison office back in the 1970s. And so he also understood that the Chinese only respect fairness, firmness, when matters of principle are concerned. People like Jim, and later Kurt Campbell, focused particularly on Taiwan's defense needs, grounded in the language of the TRA, but also in the, involve, the evolving military needs of the island. When it comes to Taiwan's international space, one can look at two major facets. First, that cluster of nations misnamed by Taiwan officials as allies that maintain formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan. To be honest and perhaps a little blunt, I'm not sure I could locate many of them on a map. And they are generally small enough that blandishments of foreign assistance keep them in the Republic of China fold. Another battlefield, if I may uh, mis misuse the, the, the title of that concern, is in international organizations like WTO, the WHO, and so forth. And here, the struggle has always been centered squarely on what Beijing will permit. Uh, developments since President Tsai Ing-wen took office demonstrate how little one can expect from Xi Jinping on this score, in my opinion. I think it's pretty clear where Xi is coming from. Unwilling and perhaps unable under the rules of, governing, of the game for today's Communist Party to contemplate genuine democratic reform at home, Xi has instead fanned nationalistic passions among China's young citizens. Therefore, in Xi's game plan, Taiwan is unfinished business in modern China's march to glory. For a while, things seemed to be going well for Xi there. Former President Ma ying a mainlander at heart, was prepared to deal with Beijing in a very accommodating manner, one that Xi naturally embraced. But Madam Tsai's election ended that diplomatic truce and ushered back in the sort of hostile PRC attitude we veterans of the Chen Sui Bian era remember well. As some of you have heard me say before, I believe the real foundation of Taiwan's continued vitality in the global community lies with those countries willing to work productively with Taiwan even without the trappings of formal diplomatic relations. I would posit that the first rank of these countries consists of the United States, Japan, Singapore, and Australia although others in Asia and Europe, um, certainly the EU, are also important trade and business partners with Taiwan. Friends of Taiwan here in the US, whether in government, Congress, business, or academia, should continue our active effort to maintain these vital ties, both to promote Taiwan's economic and commercial uh, progress, and also to ensure that our friends there have the military hardware and expertise to complicate any rash threats emanating from across the strait. In the meantime, while many of us hope someday the mainland will catch up with the rest of the modern world and liberalize its political system, until that time, we need to ensure that Taiwan has the tools to resist the bullying and coercion that have become stock and trade for people like President Xi Jinping. The TRA, creatively interpreted with modern realities, gave us the mechanism needed to support the autonomous and free development that the people of Taiwan deserve. And it continues to do that today. So as we meet here, it is in, on the Korean Peninsula that American policymakers are attentive and concerned. Um, that and the mercurial character of the man in the White House. But creative efforts to keep the peace in the Taiwan Strait must never tempt us to lessen our commitment to the people of what the Portuguese long ago termed the beautiful island. 
With that, I look forward to the uh, comments of my colleagues and to the questions that might arise afterwards. Thank you again. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Shelley? Thank you. Uh, it's really great to be here. I have been so impressed and delighted by the accomplishments of GTI in its very short existence. I had the pleasure of spending uh, about eight weeks in Washington this summer teaching a summer program. So it allowed me to spend time at GTI and attend their events. And I was just really, really impressed with the range of topics and the quality of the speakers. And so congratulations, truly. Uh, this is really uh, a wonderful addition to the landscape of organizations thinking about and, and helping Americans understand Taiwan. Um, I also need to apologize. I have a teaching obligation this evening in, Char in Davidson, which is near Charlotte, North Carolina. So I'm going to have to leave uh, perhaps even before the panel is all the way completed. But I, I still wanted to come to this event because I knew that there would be so many people that I wanted to learn from and hear from and meet with. So um, I'm sorry that I haven't provided you know, sort of the, the full commitment, but um, I really am glad to be here. And, and honestly, the first panel was worth the trip. I learned a lot. And uh, it's a really, really thought-provoking and sobering set of ideas that we were given in the first panel. So I often think of the TRA as kind of in that fairy tale of Sleeping Beauty. The TRA is kind of the, the last fairy, right? All the fairies <laughs> came in, and they, they gave gifts to the baby Aurora. And then the angry fairy came in. And the angry fairy came in, and she said, here's my gift. I'm going to curse this baby. When she turns 16, she's going to prick her finger on a spindle and die. But fortunately, there was one more fairy who hadn't yet given her gift. And she came in and she said, I can't change the curse, but I can soften it. So instead of dying, she will fall asleep for 100 years. And I think that's sort of what the TRA did for Taiwan. You know, it said, I can't change the fact that uh, the Nixon administration has made the decision to uh, normalize relations with the PRC and to terminate relations with the Republic of China. But Congress, as that final ferry, said, but we can soften this decision by continuing to have as substantive and meaningful and productive a relationship as is possible within the larger frame of normalization with the PRC. And so I feel like maybe I am the, the 13th fairy, or the, the last fairy now speaking to you after the first panel, uh, trying to bring a slightly different perspective, or at least inviting us to remember some aspects of US foreign policy that are sometimes very hard to uh, keep in mind and, and keep in the forefront of our thinking when we are confronting what are, in fact, very serious strategic challenges to uh, the US and to the global community. So another way that I think about uh, US foreign policy and the TRA and normalization uh, as part of US foreign policy is, you know, there's an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other shoulder. And they're both whispering into the ears of policy makers. And I'm not going to say which one is the angel and which one is the devil. Um, but I see two forces acting. And they, these are forces that are rooted in kind of human logic. But they are elaborated in theories of international relations. And they are argued both in uh, theoretical terms, we heard some of that in the first panel, and also in policy and kind of um, empirical terms. And we heard some of that in the first panel as well. So on the one shoulder are the realists who say, if we think about it from the standpoint of, of IR theory, right, the only thing that matters in international relations is power 
and strategic position, strategic advantage. So our foreign policy needs to be driven by a calculation of power and a calculation of the strategic advantage that can secure the interests of the United States and uh, sometimes, uh, and more often in the policy world than in the uh, theoretical world, our friends and allies. Well, our allies are part of, uh, part of the theory too. And it was really this logic that drove the rapprochement with the PRC back in the early 1970s. The calculus that, the, that China could be a, a strategic asset to the US in the Cold War competition against the Soviet Union. So, you know, in a way, the US was following uh, Chairman Mao's theory of contradictions, right? That primary contradiction is with the Soviet Union, so we should make an alliance with the PRC, or at least we should have a, a better relationship with the PRC in order to uh, confront the Soviet Union uh, from a position of greater strength. And because the commitment that uh, Nixon and Kissinger had to this realist understanding of the world and this uh, realist sort of ideology of how the world works was so strong, they were willing, the historical record suggests, to let nature take its course with respect to Taiwan. That they were not particularly concerned about preserving a relationship with Taiwan that would allow Taiwan to continue as an autonomous political entity beyond some reasonable transitional interval after normalization. The TRA, though, corrected that error. And I think that is in part because there were others who looked at the Taiwan case from a realist standpoint and said, Actually, we need Taiwan for many of the strategic reasons that were described in the previous panel. But there were also many people in Congress who were guided by the other angel, which is the angel of liberalism, for, to use again the parlance of international relations theory. The idea that it is not only power and security and, and sort of strategic advantage that matters in international relations, but also um, other more cooperative imperatives meaningfully exist in the relationships among states. So economics matters uh, and values matter. Having states that share a particular point of view, a particular uh, world view or set of priorities in their own domestic, political, and economic life is valuable and in and of itself. So the one angel says, you know, whatever it takes to accomplish our strategic advantage is what we should do. And the other angel says, we need to temper our strategic thinking with some sense of values and of the um, opportunities that international relations presents, as well as the threats that are inherent in the relations among states. And uh, the last point I, I would like to make is just thinking now about uh, what these two points of view imply for US-Taiwan relations in the present. So clearly, if we attend to values, if we care about uh, cultivating and nurturing states in the international community that are democratic, that embrace uh, genuine free market economics and so on, then we have to worry about the fate of Taiwan. We have to uh, at least, even if we can't, uh, even if we can't ensure Taiwan's future, we ought to at least uh, pay attention and put effort into uh, acting in accordance with our values when it comes to Taiwan. So the one, the one shoulder, the one advisor on our shoulder, which might be an angel or might be a devil, 
um, says, you know, you got to care about Taiwan because values matter and because there are a lot of opportunities for the U.S. through this relationship and through sort of remaining true to the essence of the TRA and the spirit of creativity, which I think is a, a really uh, valuable phrase to keep in mind about the TRA. On the other shoulder, though, it's not so obvious what the policy recommendation is about Taiwan. Because on the one hand, there is always the possibility that the strategic advantage to the US might be most readily um, secured and pursued by abandoning Taiwan, right? Um, and this was the first of the three schools of thought that Mike Green suggested, the sort of accommodationist grand bargain. You know, we can't afford this Taiwan thing anymore. We just need to let it go. But another possibility is that uh, from a realist perspective, we may decide that we need to use Taiwan as a strategic, as a tool of a strategic competition with China that Taiwan becomes a kind of weapon for the US to use against China. So what appears to be a, a pro-Taiwan policy is in fact a, uh, an anti-China policy in which Taiwan is deployed as an instrument or tool or weapon. And I would say that either of those is problematic and needs to be, again, tempered with an understanding of values. Because both of those two approaches, driven by this kind of realist calculus which is never untempered or unmitigated uh, or uninfluenced by aspects of liberalism, but sometimes can be very ascendant. Either of those two approaches treats Taiwan as a means to the end of a particular US position. And I would argue that in the long run, we will be truer to our own values as Americans if we remember that Taiwan is also an end in itself and not simply a tool or a means to the ends of others, be they uh, others in Beijing or others in the US. Thank you. So what, which turn do I hit? Right, so okay. Left okay. To go. Um, Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Congratulations to GTI for on its uh, first annual conference. And thanks to GTI for doing what you do every week of the year to help keep Taiwan at more at the forefront of consciousness here in Washington, DC and around the United States. Um, I realize that, that we have experienced a very special moment. This is the first time in my too long career that the tale of Sleeping Beauty has been used <laughs> to explain Taiwan. And it may be the last. But, and that makes it all the more special, right? You have grandchildren, don't you? No, no I she do has not. two daughters. She has two daughters. Um, I'm going to talk about what the topic says. And that's the TRA and what the TRA says uh, about um, the issue of international space. I realized when I saw Jacques Delisle sitting out in front of 1777 F Street that that might have been a mistake. <laughs> because Jacques really knows what, it, what he's talking about when it comes to law. I, mean, I will warn you at the outset that, that I actually do not believe that the TRA as law um, says what many of us think it says about Taiwan's international space. However, that does not matter. What is important uh, in all of this is whether or not U.S. policymakers decide that as a matter of policy, promoting Taiwan's international space uh, and helping it play the kind of constructive role that it can is in the national interest of the United States. So let me um, sort of jump to my presentation. Um, we're, what we're talking about is section four of the TRA, particularly uh, subsection four of section four. And that's what we have on the screen. Um, just. Um, 
Section 4, subsection 4 says, nothing in this act shall be construed as a basis for supporting the exclusion or expulsion of Taiwan from continued membership in any international financial institution or any international organization. And that sounds good. But what is important in terms of the actions of the executive branch is how the executive branch interprets these sections and how the executive branch evaluates the way in which um, laws require it to do things, forbid it to do things, allow it to do things, or something different. There is an office in the Department of State called the uh, Office of Legal Counsel, L for short, that is the true gatekeeper on these issues. And uh, they are the ones that look at something like the TRA and ask, you know, what do we have to do here? Uh, what are we forbidden from doing? What can we get away with? And so we, we need to keep in mind the very talented lawyers in that office when uh, thinking about what the executive branch actually does uh, in response to um, things like this subsection. Um, now, I think the text needs to be read carefully for what it says and what it doesn't say. Um, well, never mind. Um, th there's um, Note at the end of this subsection the phrase continued membership. Now on this, on its face, this formulation covered organizations where Taiwan is still present and not where it is not. Um, and so the executive branch interpretation would be, well, this doesn't require uh, helping uh, Taiwan get into new organizations. Um, the, that provision mentions international financial organizations, and it's probably a reference to uh, the IMF and the World Bank. Um, and um, I think that this was the true motivation for this section, that Taiwan was still in the IMF and the World Bank at the time that the TRA was being legislated. It didn't want to be driven out, and uh, so it sought the help of its uh, friends in Congress in creating a defense mechanism. And you know, the question is uh, um, where, you know, whether it served as a good defense uh, mechanism. Uh, in fact, the Carter administration, in principle, supported uh, the PRC taking over um, China's membership in the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, really didn't do anything to help Taiwan uh, preserve its position. The Reagan administration did a better job in preserving Taiwan's uh, membership in the Asian uh, Development Bank. Um, I mean, if you look at this provision, it, it also doesn't really say anything about what the executive branch should do. You know, when the Congress really wants the, uh, um, Cong the executive branch to do something, it says, the president shall. Hmm. Uh, not should, but shall. That, that word shall is a very powerful word in legislative construction. So um, this one says, nothing in this act shall be construed as a basis support for supporting exclusion or expulsion, et cetera, et cetera. To my reading, you know, as somebody who worked on Capitol Hill and knows how these games are played, uh, I think all this is saying to the executive branch is, um, if you choose to support the exclusion or expulsion of Taiwan from international organizations, don't blame the TRA. I think that's all it says. Um, so we have a section that, that says less than it seems to say. Um, what we can say is that the spirit of this section is that uh, on balance we support Taiwan being in the international community, but as a matter of law, um, it doesn't. Now, you can ask what's going on here. Uh, why is this language so weak from an ob uh, for an objective that is worthy of support? The answer to these questions, I think, involves a couple of different factors, 
Um, there's this issue of legislative construction, which I've already mentioned. Um, second was the politics surrounding the passage of the TRA. Um, first of all, the Congress was working under the gun to get this bill out the door and onto President Carter's desk. Uh, May 31st was the day that we were going to uh, establish diplomatic relations with Taiwan, uh, and the Congress very much wanted to finish the bill uh, before that day. Uh, it felt probably that it had more leverage uh, to get what it wanted uh, if it acted um, before March 31st, and it succeeded in that. Um, on the other hand, um, the floor managers of this bill, the chairman and ranking member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, um, did want to pass a bill that President Carter would sign. Not just any bill, but a bill that the president would sign. So the dirty little secret is that behind the scenes of the writing of the TRA, um, key members, and their staff and ex officials of the executive branch were working together to get a text that could be sold to Congress uh, and, but also sold to President Carter. Uh, and uh, that um, President Carter would choose uh, to interpret as not binding him in any way, serious way. Um, and that's what we come up with. This is not the only place that that happened. Um, but, um, you know, the goal was to get a bill. Um, I would note that the Carter administration had already undercut the TRA in a way when it comes to international organizations because it had recognized the government of the People's Republic of China as the sole legal government of China. And what that means is that PRC gets China's seat in the uh, in international organizations, um, and sort of Taiwan's left out in the cold. Um, now, let me touch on the rest of Section Four very briefly, um, and um, this has to do with something called the application of laws, uh, and. Section 4, in various ways, says that when U.S. law refers to countries or nations as the objects of U.S. law and programs, these laws and programs should apply to Taiwan. Um, I think the purpose of, this, uh, of these provisions was technical, not substantive. It was very important that the agencies of the executive branch have guidance on whether to apply a specific law to Taiwan um, or not. Uh, and, you know, there was care taken to make sure that this in no way suggested uh, that Taiwan was a sovereign state. So this is the realm of law. TRA is weaker than we think. As a, uh, the spirit of the law is uh, something we all agree with, but the letter of the law really doesn't. Um, in the realm of power, which Shelley has talked about, um, you know, once uh, China gets into any of these international organizations, uh, it has used its power to block uh, Taiwan from any appreciable role. Um, however, what is truly important is that for about 20 years, uh, American policymakers have recognized and accepted and promoted the idea that Taiwan should play a, um, a, a larger role in uh, international affairs, um, that it should not be excluded. <clears throat> One reason that policymakers came to this conclusion was that it was clear that the people of Taiwan wanted it. They wanted to participate in, the, in world affairs and, and do so with uh, dignity. Um, I think that one policy implication of this, of the situation we're in where law and power and policy interact in various ways, is that Taiwan should not um, pursue this issue in a way that plays to China's strengths. And China's strength is its dominant position in most international governmental organizations. Taiwan should find ways in which it can play to China's weakness, 
or play where it, it where China doesn't play. I actually think that the university games that were just held in Taiwan is an excellent example of the very positive and constructive role that Taiwan can play. Thank you very much. Walter? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you to uh, GTI and Russell for, for having me here. Um, John used the right word. In some ways, I'm overpowered here on the, on the <laughs> TRA. Um, if I want to know something about the TRA, I take uh, Richard's book off the shelf where I look at John's old heritage work and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and call, call Richard from time to time to ask him questions about it. So uh, what I tried to do today is to um, uh, find a niche somewhere I could, I could be helpful. And uh, since I have a foot in both worlds, that is in Taiwan, and in many of the countries that Taiwan is now reaching out to as a part of its southbound policy, um, I thought it could be helpful to just expand a little bit on the international space half of the question that the panel um, is focused on. Uh, so I'm going to look at the new, new southbound policy um, and look at three basic questions here. Why it matters to the United States, why it's more feasible this time than it has been in the previous, uh, previous attempts at this, and uh, number three, how the U United States can help Taiwan in its effort to, to, to reach out to, to its south. Um, first of all, why it matters to the United States. This is a question I get a lot when I talk to people about southbound here, uh, because it's not immediate, immediately apparent why the United States should get involved as a third party in uh, Taiwan's outreach to Indonesia or India or, or anybody else in the region. Um, and I would say for, for a few reasons here. Uh, one is it's international space is important to us. It is important, like Mike said in the first panel, it is important that the United States uh, prevent a single uh, hegemon from, from controlling uh, the Western Pacific uh, in particular. And so the, the, the southbound policy, I would argue, is an integral part of Taiwan's effort to build international space. Obviously, its involvement in international organizations, I think its uh, diplomatic allies uh, are important, an important element of that. I think it's all of its unofficial representation around the world is, is very important in that. But I think the southbound policy, likewise, can be uh, an essential part of its effort to expand its space. Um, the second reason why it matters to the United States is um, it creates a, a context for U.S. policy in the region. The better Taiwan's reputation in uh, Southeast Asia, in India, uh, the more responsibly it behaves, um, the more south, uh, soft power it's able to uh, acquire, the easier it is for the United States to act on Taiwan's behalf. The, the better context for an arms sale from the United States, the better context for uh, for economic uh, diplomacy with, uh, with Taiwan, uh, the better context for our efforts to get it accepted into international organizations. And then the third reason why it matters to the United States is because in and of itself, what Taiwan has to offer is good. It has a lot of expertise in, in uh, medical field. It has expertise in HADR. Um, it has expertise in supply chain management and that sort of thing that it can share with the region. And so in and of itself, it has things to offer that are, that are good and that the, the region uh, will embrace. Okay, uh, moving to the question of uh, why it's more feasible this time. Uh, another question that comes up uh, occasionally, usually by the people who are sort of more initiated in what Southbound is all about is, well, we tried this before and it didn't work. You know, uh, Li Dong Wei tried it. Uh, in a couple different iterations, and, and Chen Chi Ben tried it as well. Uh, why is it going to work this this time? Um, and, and here I also have uh, a few reasons to mention. Number one is the wariness of China that's that's uh, growing in the region. Um, there's a certain skepticism about China uh, throughout Southeast Asia. I think that is. Uh, that is uh, very apparent when you're talking to the foreign ministries and, and officials and politicians um, in places like Singapore. Um, uh, Singapore is a perfect example, too, because um, against all sort of common sense, the way I would see common sense, the Chinese over the last year or so have taken on Singapore. You know, of all the problems you have to deal with, why would you take on Singapore? 
you know, Singapore can be your friend if you're, if you're China, but they have taken uh, Singapore on, seizing their Terex vehicles in Hong Kong, taking them on in the non align movement, calling them out on, on law of the sea statements they've made and things like that. So uh, I would single out Singapore as a particular example of a country that is open to, um, to facilitating more Taiwanese involvement in Southeast Asia in particular. The one caveat here, though, especially dealing with Southeast Asia, is you can't make that tie too explicit. You can't make the tie between this effort and, and, um, and concern about China too explicit, because that will scare the Southeast Asians particularly off. I always talk about Southeast Asian countries as, as cats. You know, they're like cats. You have, if you want to grab it, you have to sneak up on it very softly <laughs> you know, and then scoop it up. If you make sudden moves, they scatter. Okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you, you just have to give them plausible deniability. You reach out to them, build cultural links, build educational links, but don't make it explicit why you're doing it. They know why you're doing it. You don't have to tell everyone in the world why you're doing it. Um, the second reason it's more feasible is the, um, the economics have changed. Um, back when Li Dong Wei tried this, uh, he was interrupted by the 1997-98 uh, financial crisis, which suddenly made Southeast Asia much less attractive an environment for investment and trade. And China, by contrast, was improving in its, uh, in its attractiveness uh, to foreign capital. And you had both of them join the, the, the WTO. And so, um, at least on the economic side, there was less interest in, in, uh, in investing by Taiwan, Taiwanese companies in Southeast Asia in particular. Uh, another a caveat on this, on this account is, okay, so Taiwan has, um, has more to offer to the region economically, relatively speaking, uh, than it did um, you know, 20 years ago. Um, but it's not competing with China in that way. And I think that's another element we have to keep in mind is that, okay, we, Taiwan has a lot of offer. They should make that uh, clear to the Southeast Asians and South, uh, and South Asia, particularly India, but don't make it about a competition with China because at this stage, that's kind of absurd. You know, the Chinese are talking about a uh, trillion dollars in global infrastructure spending and Taiwan is talking about a $3 billion uh, pot of money they're going to make available for public, uh, public spending in, in the Go South countries. So um, don't make it about competition with China uh, on the economic side, but just do it. And, and again, like the other point I made, the region will understand what you're doing. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to make it explicit. Uh, the third way it's, it's more plausible this time is that it's structured much differently. Uh, Tsai Ing-wen has structured this in really an ingenious way, I think, because I think she recognizes the latter point that I just made, that, that Taiwan doesn't have the resources to compete with China today uh, on the economic side. Um, but it has a lot of other things. It has its culture, it has its education, it has its experience, uh, it has its democracy. Um, there's a lot of things that it can offer uh, to the region. And so she has housed the economic part of this in a much broader effort, a much longer term effort to build a community that includes Taiwan, to build a community of Pacific, Indo-Pacific nations of which Taiwan is a part. Um, and so um, that's something that she, uh, she can actually accomplish, I think, over, over her term in office. Uh, the third point here, how to, uh, the, the, the third section here, how, to, how the U United States can help Taiwan in its effort to, to look south. Um, I think we can talk more about, about Taiwan and about Taiwan's effort in our interaction with countries in Southeast Asia, uh, Australia, et cetera. I mean, if I, if I have one negative thing to say about southbound policy right now is that I'm not sure many people know that there is a southbound policy outside of Taiwan. You know, if you look at the press, all the press on it is Taiwanese press. They're fighting about it. They're making, you know, they're giving details about it. They're, uh, they're, um, uh, you know, um, getting it out there in the public. But I'm not sure that most of Southeast Asia, and particularly in India, really know that this thing is going on. So the United States can help talk it up in our conversations with, uh, with our friends in those capitals. Uh, the second thing is to enhance a program called the C, uh, GCTF, uh, Global Cooperation and Training uh, Framework. Um, enhance that program, make it much more active. There's been seven or eight 
uh, workshops and training initiatives over the last uh, two years. I think there's more that we can do on that, uh, looking at things like HADR and, and, uh, and disease prevention, areas where um, Taiwan, Taiwan has some expertise to offer. I'd also suggest that it be focused more on the region as opposed to, I mean, you still call it global, but when you think about how much Taiwan has to offer and how it can get the best bang for its buck, maybe you concentrate it a little bit and, and, and invite people from the region, give the region a much more, um, a, a much bigger slice of, uh, slice of the action in those. Uh, the third thing we can do to help, I think, is to have a very active trade policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Taiwan. Um, you know, I'm not sure, honestly, I mean, except for the sort of broad reasons we all know why the United States cannot come to an initiative on a free trade agreement with Taiwan. It's just one of the first things that I talked to uh, mm -hmm. Ed Fulner about when I got to the Heritage Foundation. I said, you know, we should push for a free trade agreement with Taiwan. He said, yeah, hey, that's a good idea. I mentioned it 30 years ago. <laughs> so it has been around a long time. I don't know why we can't pull the trigger on it. If the or. United States can do it, <laughs> then that will encourage others to move ahead with new, uh, with new initiatives as well. And by the same token, if the United States for some reason cannot bring itself to do this, how can you expect uh, countries in the region that are much more, uh, much more dependent on China than we are uh, to be able to do that? Um, the, the, the fourth thing is that I think we could do, I think we could do um, more at a track two level with Taiwan. I think how, uh, as Dan Klingman uh, said in the, in the previous panel, Taiwan has um, some experience to offer in terms of being in the crosshairs of China for, uh, for the last 60 years, however you want to calculate. Um, and, and I think they can offer more to attract two dialogues. There was, the, there was a considerable amount of activity in Southeast Asia over the last um, 20, 30 years but it's fallen off, and many of the initiatives that Southeast Asia was involved in uh, at a multilateral level through its think tanks uh, have, have fallen off. So I think there's more that we can do, there's more places like Heritage could do, AEI, other, other organizations in town to bring Taiwan into a broader conversation um, about the region and not just isolate it always in this uh, sort of uh, niche uh, area of concern. So with that, I, uh, I look forward to the question and answer. I think I, uh, I'm not an expert on the TRA, but just like any Washingtonian, I have a lot of opinions about it. <laughs> so uh, I'll be glad to. I'll be glad to talk about it. Great. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, I might uh, say that we have about seven minutes left for Dr. Rigor, and that if, if you have any uh, uh, sort of um, final notes or comments that you want to make before you leave, then I, I'll give you the opportunity now, or otherwise. Yeah, we, I think we can go ahead and have conversation. We need to filibuster. Great. Yes. Hello, uh, Ben Lawson, Navy. This question is for Dr. Rigor. So uh, <laughs> uh, as you discussed, uh, the U.S. looking for a, to promote democracy and generally a good thing with Taiwan, with the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, of course, in 1979, Taiwan was not a democracy. So other than being a strategic partner, what did the U.S. see in Taiwan? And maybe you could even apply this to other countries in the region to show us that they would be this good thing for the world. So that's a, that's a really important question and something that I was thinking about after I finished speaking that I should have... Um, uh, elaborated more, yeah, it's true that when the TRA was signed, Taiwan was still a single party authoritarian state. But it was a single party authoritarian state that was not only anti-communist, but also uh, actively involved in a kind of free market economics that was very congenial to the US. And that was already, I would argue, showing the slightest green shoots of political transformation. And it was especially that uh, period between 1972 and 1979 when Taiwan uh, was given by fate uh, a longer kind of runway to prepare itself for normalization than would otherwise have happened without Nixon's resignation and Mao Zedong's death in the middle of the decade. 
uh, Taiwan was given time to kind of prepare for this change. And so Taiwanese were very involved in thinking about what the TRA would look like and helping to guide the creation of the TRA. And even in that process, I think there was some suggestion that they understood that Taiwan would be a better interlocutor, partner, uh, friend to the US if it undertook political change. So the political change that happened in Taiwan was kind of vestigial or, or, or infant in the 1970s, but accelerated really pretty quickly after the 1970s in this atmosphere that was created largely by the US Congress of this is what you need to do, right? This is, who, this is what you need to become in order to remain relevant to the US, in order to convert your value from simply a, a bulwark against communist expansion to a, uh, a partner and friend and, and ally of the US in a kind of comprehensive sense. So it is absolutely true that Taiwan has fundamentally altered its value to the US through the process of democratization. But I think in some ways uh, that is a much more robust and durable basis for a relationship that Taiwan is across the board in alignment with uh, fundamental values espoused by um, US, the US government over many generations. Uh, and honestly, part of the motivation then for speaking in this way today is that I sense softness on the values question from the current administration. Uh, they go back and forth. Sometimes they talk about values. Sometimes they talk about how values are not very important. Um, I don't think there's any uh, value-based leadership from the top of this administration. So that, to me, is a very uh, important <coughs> challenge to Taiwan um, and to US friends around the world is if the US were to uh, abandon this generation's long commitment to <laughs> values in its foreign policy, then what is the basis of Taiwan's importance to the US? Taiwan can still fall back on these kinds of strategic, you know, first island chain, all of that, but does Taiwan really want to be, as someone said this morning, the, the point of the spear? You know, that is that is a scary characterization to me for uh, the lives of 23 million people, that they are the point of a spear. I would uh, add that uh, I was on the Taiwan desk at the time. D Steve Young was in AIT at the time, and uh, uh, Dr. Bush was on Capitol Hill at the time. You must have your views on this. I recall when I was in Beijing on December 16, 1978, almost the first reaction from Taiwan was Jiang Jingwu canceled the elections. And that was, elections, you know, were put off for a year while Taiwan tried to uh, 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 digest this. Um, and then almost a year later was the uh, uh, Kaohsiung incident, mm -hmm. uh, the marches and the, um, the courts martial and February and March of 1980, the murder of Li Lin Yixiong's family. Mm -hmm. um, and all of this involved Congress's reaction in a very strong way, especially the Democratic majority at the time, which is very um, human rights oriented, democracy oriented, uh, as opposed to the Republicans at the time, which are very security oriented and, and Cold War oriented. Um, but I can see what you, I, I'd ask your. Um, my perspective is that um, the Congress's view sort of after normalization was really up for grabs. The KMT regime had built a strong bulwark of support on anti-communist and just friendship grounds and other incentives as well. Um, and after the Kaohsiung incident, the um, balance of power within the regime was very much on security and not on political reform. There did emerge, um, with the support and encouragement of Taiwanese Americans, 
a group of four members um, who um, promoted uh, democracy and human rights. Um, I worked for one of them. Um, I think that you know there were Democrats who um, uh, sort of took the traditional view of Taiwan and uh, didn't emphasize democracy and human rights so much. Um, but this idea that uh, a democratic Taiwan would have a better claim on the friendship and support of the American people had entered the mix. And Chiang Jingwo bought that argument. And uh, what really sprang this loose were, were events in Taiwan that led Jiang to decide that the last thing he did before he died was going to start the process of, of democratization. Um, and um, so it's a little more complicated than, than you were describing, but uh, that, that was the direction in which at least some in Congress were going. Steve, do you have any remem reminiscences from Taiwan of TRA? Were you? Well, I, I guess um, obviously Richard uh, has made some very good points. I, I do credit Zhang Jingguo with a brilliant move. Uh, two, two steps, actually. The first was his decision to begin to open up the political system, but also his cho choosing of Li Donghui, mm -hmm. uh, a native Taiwanese, mm -hmm. to be his vice president and heir was an incredible um, preface to the remarkable democratization that Taiwan went through. Um, and I, I, I do think that, I mean, the other thing is that the Chinese showed a, a side of them that many people have been trying to uh, avoid in 1989. So between Taiwan's moving toward a more open society and China going backwards at a time when many hoped its economic progress would lead to political liberalization, uh, created a very new environment in the 1990s in which some good things happened for Taiwan. Well, the question is, of in 1989, you had Tiananmen, 1990, 91, 92, you had the uh, wild lily movement mm -hmm. in Taiwan that just sort of turned everything upside down. But did, did Congress's uh, support and the administration's support during the Clinton and subsequent years change because of that, or was, was there more going on? Um, I think the general view uh, was that uh, Taiwan had become the sort of poster child for democratization in the non sort of white world, um, and particularly in contrast to Tiananmen and all that it revealed about the CCP regime, it was day versus night. Um, that, was that translated into anything that Taiwan could tangibly hold on to? Um, there um, were effort in the, in the process of dealing with Tiananmen sanctions and uh, in the process of dealing with the issue of linkage of China's MFN status to human rights, which was the key issue in, in the early 90s, uh, Taiwan was able to use friends in Congress to get uh, get some benefits, um, and then you s sort of very soon you slide into um, Li Donghui's desire um, to visit the United States, and the support, um, almost unanimous support of uh, members of Congress that it it so should be. And uh, Clinton realized that when uh, that you know he had lost that battle, and so went ahead. Yeah, I think uh, I think absolutely. Congress's uh, the change in Congress had an impact on our policy toward Taiwan, uh, largely because of that, because it bucked up the the uh, Clinton administration. The Clinton administration needed some spine yes. on mm -hmm. on Taiwan, and the fact that Congress got so active in the 1990s. Uh, they were passing dozens of resolutions. Uh, the, the one on uh, Li Dongwei's uh, visa and his mm -hmm. speech at his alma mater being one of them. So uh, the TSEA, you re you'll remember, uh, sort of improving the 
the, the TRA as they saw it. It uh, didn't pass ultimately, but it did have an effect on uh, spurring along uh, some of those security issues. So um, I think it had a big, a, a big um, impact. Uh, going back to something Shelley was saying, her, her um, uh, you know, metaphor with the angel, the angel and devil on one side or another. I think for the most part, you know, I, I, I can't go back to the 1970s and how this played out, but I would say Congress is the angel on, mm. on Taiwan policy uh, because it's not reliant on a single individual, the whims of a guy that comes into office. If Donald Trump comes into office and he decides he wants to sell Taiwan to China and that, that deals with the trade deficit problem, um, you know, uh, what's to stop them? It's hard to stop them. I mean, the bureaucrats can speak up and you can have a lot of civil society getting involved, uh, but who's gonna stop them? Congress is gonna stop them. And, and there is a, a very deep reservoir of support for, for Taiwan on the Hill. It, it, goes to, it goes to sleep a little bit periodically, but it can always be revved up because of some of these fundamentals and, and, and the, the most important fundamental now really is this value Mm -hmm. proposition mm -hmm. that's not going to change with time. It's not going to change with the calculations of realpolitik. It's there for good, and it will continue to, to support Taiwan. I might have been thinking along those lines, but it seemed like kind of not so polite to suggest <laughs> that the, the realists on the previous panel were somehow the devils in the room. <laughs> um, but anyway, please the forgive me. Angels. I need to go and attend to my students, but thank Shelley, you. Shelley, thank you very much. Safe travel. We have another uh, 15 minutes for questions. Uh, um, I would like to go to the, I, I won't, but I would like to go to the people in the rear. I will ask Dr. Or Professor Dalil to uh, ask his question because uh, his name has been taken in vain here. So. Yeah, out of respect. <laughs> I don't know if it's been taken away. Jacques Delisle, University of Pennsylvania and Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, Richard, you would have made a great lawyer. I mean that as a compliment. Uh, <laughs> I, I know it, it often isn't used that way. Um, but just a couple of, of responses to it. One is uh, that um, I think some of the more mandatory parts of Section 4 that you're talking about were not purely technical. They also were, were partly the treat Taiwan as if it is still yeah. a government of a state. And that certainly ticked off the mainland uh, mm -hmm. because they saw it as a violation of the communique and, and yeah. have complained. Uh, ever since. Um, and I wonder if another piece of the story that's a little more technical for the other Office of Legal Counsel, the one in justice, uh, is that we have a separation of powers issue. Congress is on firm ground in saying how Taiwan should be treated under US law and domestic matters, but you get into things that look like diplomatic recognition. After all, Goldwater v. Carter turned out as mm -hmm. it did. And uh, international organizations are a little bit in that space. So I think there may be some of that. Um, and I think it's also section four is in some ways the thing that laid the foundation for what has been a brilliant strategy by Taiwan, which I think plays to your comment about playing to its weakness, as playing to its strengths and not its weaknesses, which is the as if strategy, you know, to okay. behave as if it were part of the UN mm -hmm. human rights covenants, behave as if it were part of the non-proliferation regime and so on. And, and in a way section four does that. The US treats it as if it's a state. What I wanted to ask you is whether the TRA is also important as a precedent foundation or is merely a symptom of this being an area where Congress mucks around in foreign policy in a way it often doesn't. I mean, the Taiwan issue really does stand out. Do you see the TRA as having been a foundation for that or is it just a symptom of the success Taiwan has had in getting Congress to, uh, to pay attention to it? Um, one factual point, um, much of what became Section 4 was in the original administration's draft bill. They knew that they needed something like this. Uh, and uh, so it was strengthened uh, um, in the process of uh, developing the legislation and in part because of interventions by the American business community in Taiwan. Um, but I, I think that there was sort of an understanding from the outset that something like this was needed. Um, whether you think that or whatever you think about the Taiwan Relations Act as, um, as binding direction in sort of some of these controversial or sensitive issues like arms sales or international space, uh, I think the, the fact that Congress asserted itself um, and the fact that our memories of that period focus on, on the assertion of congressional power um, 
serves as something of a, a check even today on um, administrations that would make mischief. Um, you know, whether it truly was a success story, it is a success story because that's what we remember. And one aspect of, of the toughening up of the TRA was Congress's um, anger at not being consulted. Um, and um, that's an important lesson, too, that if you're going to do something as controversial as this, you know, get some people uh, with you who, who understand why and, and can support you. Yeah, I, I, Steve. Well, uh, as, a, as a sign of how successful the TRA has been, um, Jimmy Carter now tries to take credit for it. <laughs> um, and he came to Taiwan uh, when I was deputy director. I, f I forget when. Yeah, that's uh, uh, 99. And, and, um, and gave a speech from which he you know, took, took credit for it. And that, that's, that's fine. Uh, uh, um, I'm trying to remember who, who it was. Annette Liu or somebody stood up and said, hey, you know, not yeah. so fast. Right, right, right. But um, uh, it has survived well because it has been kind of a spirit rather than a bunch of, mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of specific words. And I think uh, Democratic and Republican administrations uh, have acknowledged the importance of Congress to the relationship with Taiwan in a way that, that that I think is complementary to the uh, essential effort that the executive branch has to play in managing all this. And I can say nothing shows that more clearly than the um, <coughs> growth and, and, and uh, vitality of AIT today. Um, I've gotten in trouble for this before, but someday, some year, they're going to open that damn new building. Uh, that, I thought uh, they opened it already. Yeah. No, 2018, early 2018. Uh, it's, it's, it's the carrot on the end of the stick. Yeah. Is it the Nehu building? You mean? As the guy who found the, the property in 1999, I have a vested interest in this. And, and uh, uh, I, I just, there's a book to be written about that. Steve and I surveyed property behind a dike uh, <laughs> that uh, sort of periodically flooded, and we agreed at that time that we did not want AIT. That's right, because the Taipei American School reminded us of the <laughs> flooding that That's they right. abandoned when they moved to the new site. Yeah, I would just interject that uh, when I came on the Taiwan desk 40 years ago, well, 38 years ago, reading the Taiwan Enabling Act, which was the U.S. government's, which right. was the State Department's version, yeah. and the, um, the TRA, to see where the differences were. The, the wording was very much the same in a lot of areas yeah. that I didn't expect, and one of which was, was this section four. Of course, all of section two, which said it, sh it shall be the policy of the United yes. States two, one, two, three, four, five, six. That was all sort of put in there. Mm -hmm. And then section three, which mandated that the president make available to Taiwan, he said that the president shall make available to Taiwan such mm -hmm. defense articles, that wasn't in it. And it didn't, it, it, the further mandate was that the president shall uh, make his decisions on arms sales to Taiwan based solely on uh, his view of Taiwan's mm -hmm. need, defense needs in consultation with the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this wound up being honored more in the breach than the observance. But mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the whole, um, idea that the TRA was very uh, supportive of U.S. support for Taiwan's continued participation in international organizations. I think that was in from the beginning, and I think the State Department had that as part of the Enabling Act. Uh, Don't remember. Yeah. Um, it also mandated that the, all treaties be, con all treaties con continue in force. I had thought that the Congress had put that in, but that was part of the original Taiwan Enabling Act. And because of that, the State Department and, the, and Ambassador Woodcock, well, the State Department said, uh, we cannot terminate the Mutual Defense Treaty uh, on the basis of breaking relations with the Republic of China alone. Um, and this is where I think Senator Goldwater, uh, his 
reactions. I don't know if Senator Helms was even around at that point. Um, Senator uh, Scott of Pennsylvania, um, the wind was sort of taken out of their sails because they tried to complain that the um, uh, administration was terminating the mutual defense treaty without, consultating, uh, without consulting the Senate. And indeed what happened was is that the State Department said, no, we're, we're terminating it under the terms of the treaty. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, but to, to me it was a, uh, it's a very instructive thing to read both texts. Um, we have uh, five. three more minutes. Um, five more minutes then. Um, Six. Mr. Bob, uh, I'll beat these seven. That's my final offer. At the very, at the very end there, uh, yes. Okay, th uh, thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Xin Chang. I come from Fudan University, Shanghai, and now I'm pursuing a one-year visiting scholarship at uh, Johns Hopkins. And I'm very glad to, have, uh, to be here today to meet a lot of old friends. I have a question to, sorry, Richard, okay. and uh, concerning the, uh, um, the international space issue of Taiwan. And basically, we see that, that in, uh, there are two uh, approaches for Taiwan to explore uh, international space. One is through Beijing, and another is through Washington. That is, um, first is just like diplomatic choose conducted through, across the, uh, the Taiwan Strait. And the second is uh, to ask Washington to pass bills and to say something to impose pressure upon Beijing. And now that we know the uh, thing, I think that um, uh, Tsai Ing-wen trying to pursue maybe the, uh, the second approach. And uh, we know that the, the tension across the Taiwan Street increasing. So I, my question is, what do you think about the prospect of the international space issue of Taiwan in the coming uh, three or four years? And um, it will shrink, it will expand, or it will maintain a status quo. Thank you. Great. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of time, so but other people did have questions, and I wanted to get make sure. Uh, if you have a short question, maybe uh, Joe Bosco, uh, and then yes, and then you. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> thank you, John. That was a superb panel, as well as the uh, one earlier this morning. And uh, I think it came across loud and clear in this morning's panel that <clears throat> both from a moral and uh, idealistic standpoint and geostrategically, geographically, Taiwan is critical to U.S. national interests in Asia. It's a slam dunk based on what we heard from the, the first panel this morning. Now, for all the wonders of the TRA, which I do uh, as well applaud, it does have a, an element of strategic ambiguity. While we provide defense articles for Taiwan, there's not a commitment for the defense of Taiwan. And I wonder if uh, you gentlemen would like to comment on whether the Trump administration will relook at that issue and whether it should. Okay, there are. Uh First question is um, about Taiwan's international space going through Washington or Beijing in the coming years, and what are the prospects? Joe's uh, uh, look at Taiwan's uh, uh, U.S. strategic relationship in the uh, in the Trump administration, and then maybe I could ask you to. Um, thank you, John. Uh, Hong Bin Ding, Loyola University, Maryland. Um, my question is for uh, Mr. Lohman is about the uh, cell phone policy. So um, it's really interesting to hear that the question about what, uh, how can U.S. help being asked here in Washington. Now, uh, more specifically, I'm wondering how exactly should Taiwan sell the idea of South Bank policy to our friends in Washington? Um, who, are, who are the people who are most likely to listen? And uh, how should Taiwan message this package so that it become easy for, the, for whoever is listening to incorporate idea and take action to help out? Now, a second part of this uh, question, messaging question, is that, well, after all, Chai Tsai Ing-wen is under pressure to prove that this South Bank policy can work. So uh, from the, the Tsai Ing-wen government's point of view, and also from the Washingtonian friends' point of view, what are the uh, priorities for Thai government to initiate, to 
engage the Southeast Asian countries so that in about a year or two years of time, then the Thai government can sell back to the taxpayers in Taiwan and our friends in Washington say, hey, look, uh, Southbound policy does work and we can work together to accomplish something big and good here. Okay. Thank you. These are three good questions. The, the first and third seem to be linked, um, but I'll ask. Uh... Um, Xin Chang, it's nice to see you. Um, um, I expect um, that in the coming years, um, Taiwan will have no uh, ability to go through Beijing uh, because Beijing doesn't seem to want to talk to Taiwan. And, except under conditions that uh, are very difficult for Tsai Ing-wen to accept for political reasons. Um, I think that what uh, Taiwan can do through the United States, you have to break it into two. One is working with Congress to get uh, resolutions uh, that you know, aren't really that strong. Congress can't direct the diplomacy of the United States in most respects. Um, the U.S. government has been most successful working uh, um, behind the scenes, and uh, we've done that for a long time, and I expect we'll continue to do so. Um, to Joe Bosco's question, um, uh, um, I think that what is uh, most important right now is th that uh, the United States um, uh, show that um, it is deploying capabilities in the Western Pacific that would be relevant uh, to a war over Taiwan and strengthen the view, which I think is common in PRC defense circles, that uh, we would use those capabilities uh, in the event of a war. Uh, I think that uh, um, Beijing focuses mostly on what we have and what we do and not necessarily on what we say. If I could ask Walter then to finish uh, up very quickly on... Sure, uh, sure. Um, I guess I'll break that question down into two pieces to make it uh, easy to answer. It's a very good, very good question. Um, uh, how to sell the United States on it, how to make it um, something that um, we would support and we would do the sort of things I mentioned in my in my remarks. Um, I think, first of all, you have to demonstrate to Americans that it's in our national interest to support it. And I think I, think I laid out a few reasons why, why it would be in the U.S. interest. And I think you could sell people uh, both on the Hill and in the administration uh, on that. But, uh, but I think the most important thing is that uh, I think Tsai Ing-wen has to continue the line that she's taking really since before the before she was elected and before she was inaugurated, she has to be overly responsible in her use of language and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but, but if she pushes too hard and she's uh, too explicit and she provokes the Chinese, then it becomes something that it makes us hard to support. I'm not saying that's the way it should be. I'm just telling you that's the way it is. And that's the way it is also for the Southeast Asians. I think the reason why uh, President Chen's efforts completely failed was because it was in the context of all the other nonsense that was going going on at the time, and it made it impossible for the Southeast Asians uh, uh, um, to support. The second part of this is how she can prove it's, it's, it's working, uh, and that also ropes into how you can sell it in, in Southeast Asia. I think it already is working in some ways. You can point to, uh, you can point to, uh, international arrivals in, in Taiwan. They're, they're up from, from Southeast Asia, considerably almost making up for the, for the numbers that have declined from, from China. And part of that is traceable to the changes in visas, uh, visa status that she's given to many of the countries in the region. So it's, it's actually quantifiable that it has worked. There has already been a trend on the economic side uh, that is positive uh, for Taiwan. There's, there's some good reporting out there about Taiwanese companies already beginning to diversify a little bit from China and investing more in Southeast Asia. Um, and Southeast Asia has much more, relatively speaking, now than it did 20 years ago to offer vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, vis -vis China. So she's only accentuating those trends if she, if she does it right. And she has to claim credit for all the things that she doesn't necessarily have any power over. Mm -hmm. So you know, you talk about Taiwanese taxpayers. I mean, the thing is, she's not spending very much money at all on this thing. And some people see that as a 
as a problem that it is, she, she should spend more. But uh, she's, you know, who's going to really look at the numbers? She should take credit for everything that happens positive from here on out. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask uh, how one belt, one road meets up with southbound <laughs> policy, but I won't. I mean, we're out of time. It Thank you very much. It's been a great <laughs> panel. <laughs>